Well, oh well. I uh, haven't spoken to you guys in a while, and this is S. Uh, wow, this is Risk On uh, episode uh, two forty one. It is November fourteenth. It's a Monday after our Risk On event back in New York, uh, where we had Anthony Scaramucci on, and I could not believe Jason like what he was talking about about FTX. Uh, and so I reached out to the person who I thought was the smartest person to talk to. Um. What's it? Coin? What's her co- podcast? Coin Stories. Coin Stories. Yeah. Yeah. So I reached out to Natalie Brunel and said, please, with sugar on top, would you be on my podcast? And she immediately said yes. Uh, she, If you guys remember her, she spoke at our Risk On conference back in Vegas. I don't know a single person in the whole world of Bitcoin that doesn't think that she's brilliant or at least super educated on Bitcoin and super educator on bitcoin and i figured for the audience we'd get her on right away um we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna blow this episode up because i literally jason do have i have no idea what to think so when we first started this off bit nile was like a bit minor we we kind of like we're a small player we invested like 150 million in the space and we had a lot of people in bitcoin basically telling us to go uh you know blank off a little bit and they weren't super like friendly about like us being a miner because they were so dominant in the space. I can think of some names that are recently bankrupt. Sure. Um, so, wow, the chickens come home to roost because we're getting calls about bidding on assets that otherwise we were excluded from. People asking for loans. People ask, someone asked me for a loan in the Bitcoin community. And if I told you who asked, I would. it's so amazing to me. It's mind-blowing. That when we raised 170, 160 million in March and we paid off our debt and our shareholders went crazy, that my thesis was right, which is that I was worried that if this thing fell apart, we would not be able to pay our debt off. Uh, and we went and we went and got the money and we've been punished uh, every day for it. Uh, get off that ATM, stop doing this stuff. But now we are the survivor. Uh, yeah. As evidenced by some people who blew me off calling for money. <laughs> Someone who's never called me for money. Correct. Who has her own money, uh, who travels around in Italy and is Bitcoin educator of the world. Natalie, what's up? (laughs) How are you guys? Thanks so much for having me. What a crazy time to be alive, right? Yeah. So, Natalie, like the first person I thought of to talk to um, was you. I thought to myself, what in the world? Joe, do you agree? Was yeah. It, it popped up in your head, right? You're like, it did. Crypto Joe's on the show today. He's sitting in for Skylar, who's here in the studio. But we went right to Crypto Joe because this is a Bitcoin episode. Uh, we've got Jason Bartholomew here, my producer, Christy, Nick, and, and Brett are in, in, the, in the studio. And um, this is all going to be about um, surviving what's happening here. I am <laughs> mortified about the state of the affairs. So before I go to the Anthony Scaramucci sort of tie-in, I wanted to hear your thoughts about this um, FTX like tsunami, <laughs> and then I'll, then after we watch the Scaramucci thing, I want to come back to your state of affairs. Um, hold on, I gotta say I gotta tell someone I'm live. Yeah, I definitely saw your uh, your episode with Maria talking about how. A uh, certain political party d- uh, was donated to in the tens of millions of dollars. So I'd like to get get some more uh, feedback about that. But 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 first, I want to go to like when did you learn about the FTX debacle and what is what is your un the Natalie Brunel Bitcoin educator <laughs> commentary? We're all going to shut up and listen. <laughs> Thanks so much again for having me. I think I've been watching all the developments as they've been playing out uh, on Twitter and beyond, just like everybody else. And you know, it is interesting that a lot of Bitcoiners have been sounding the alarm on exchanges like this one and the ones where you earn yield and there are these native tokens um, for a long time and warning investors to to pull their Bitcoin off of these exchanges um, because you know many of them are offshore, they are unregulated, and you want to keep your your Bitcoin safe. And so. 
the whole ethos behind Bitcoin is really that idea of don't trust verify. And it's finally a digital asset that has no issuer that you can take custody of. You can become your own bank and Bitcoin that's not held on an exchange can't be confiscated. It's censorship resistant. Um, and it's basically yours to keep so that you can keep your money into the future based on an open source protocol um, that has the math transparently laid out right there. It's an algorithm that's set in stone with a capped supply decentralized around the world. And I trust that much more than I trust any of these crypto companies that have emerged in the space, especially in the last two years, fueled by the speculation of the money printing bonanza after the pandemic. And so people really need to be careful. And I think this whole situation makes crypto look really bad, but it actually makes Bitcoin look really good. And I'm not surprised to see that so many Bitcoin, more than 115,000 is the last report I saw, are being pulled pulled off exchanges into self-custody. So that's really inspiring to see. Natalie, I, I think that you and I are probably more purist than anything. And, I, and I'll go, I'll give you sort of the lay of the land of why I think this. So I've, I've listened to, I can't say that I've listened to, like you can never say everything, but I've listened to your educational tools. I've paid attention to your thought process and it is probably the most aligned with my own so that's why i'm such a natalie brunel fan Thank and that you. is and that is an understanding that bitcoin in its purest form is fine and mm -hmm. when you wrap it with things that can make it toxic it's not bitcoin's fault it's human beings fault right so we right. we initially went into this thinking we were going to lend on bitcoin we were going to borrow bitcoin we we're going to do all these things and as I spoke to you and Foss and others, I got, you know, like everyone else is putting this, and I hate to quote uh, Charlie Munger, but this sort of rat poisoning around it, which wasn't rat and poisoning until you add leverage to it. Mm -hmm. But I kind of agree with you that I think it makes Bitcoin actually stronger because Bitcoin itself is not the problem. It's what people are doing with it that's the problem. Just like... The U.S. dollar wasn't the problem. It was that back in 2008, 2007, 2006, people were giving people mortgages with U.S. dollars for 105% above the price of their real estate, and they were not putting any money down. Mm -hmm. So it's not the dollar's problem, and it's not Bitcoin's problem. So I've actually become more convinced that Bitcoin is the solution, not the problem, but is there now not a contagion like the people are going to be like freaking out about this? Because I know I know at Ernity, the company we own part of, they hold your Bitcoin in trust for your name. So it's not on their balance sheet. They can't lend it out. They can't do anything with it. But how do we go forward from here? I, I like you, you can't educate the world. There's seven point something billion of them. And I think a lot of people see the headlines and got to think, well, we got a big problem here. Yeah, well, we are trying to educate the world. And you're right, Bitcoin is completely different and it did not cause this. And it is neutral. It is a neutral reserve asset grade um, form of money that can't be debased. And it is unfortunately used as leverage with some of these unregulated exchanges. And then you see the price tumbling down because everything's cross collateralized and people have to have to do um, ha have to do sales. And all of a sudden you have a, a complete liquidation of the entire market. And so that's what we're seeing at large. It's not something that is wrong with Bitcoin. Bitcoin's still never been hacked. It truck treks along every 10 minutes, you know, uh, producing blocks. And so it's the only thing really in the crypto space that we can actually rely on. And I think, again, that it, it this whole situation shines a spotlight on how valuable Bitcoin is and why it was invented. And when you introduce trust and credit and you have an exchange and, and, and someone who is, in my opinion, a bad actor who is deciding to create a token and then work with another subsidiary or, or, or a sister company to wash those tokens, prop up the price, use them as collateral to get dollars, and then use those dollars to do everything from paying off politicians to buying up other companies when in reality it's just customer funds that are getting lost in the wind i mean there's something really wrong with that and and there needs to be consequences i mean we rarely <laughs> see in in the world of finance at large consequences for action that defrauds people and steals their life savings and and that is set, that's to be said about big banks and what happened in 0809 and also to be said about central banks that continue to print money and allow us to go further and further into debt you know this whole entire thing was uh, precipitated by 
you know, in my opinion, on a macro level, the tightening that happened after two years of money printing and speculation and excess. And so things started to drain out, you know, the, 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 the tide went back and you saw what was exposed. And, and unfortunately, a lot of companies had leverage. A lot of companies were based on, on quicksand. And now a lot of people, unfortunately, who are innocent, who are just trying to save for their futures and their families are paying the price. They're losing their life savings. I'm not really worried about the Tom Brady's and, you know, these hedge funds that make a bet, you know, they can afford to lose a couple hundred million. But what about all the retail investors that are part of this $8 billion hole that essentially FTX left because someone just decided to create a token, wash it through a sister company and uh, and then pay off politicians in order to be become, you know, the billionaire on the cover of Forbes. It's just, it, this shouldn't happen. Wow. Could you actually add anything to that? I don't know if I could. Hey, uh, I did an interview with Anthony Scaramucci right after he was down in, in the Bahamas. <clears throat> Literally, this guy's been all over the place. He sold 30% of his company to FTX, and he took them to see Saudi princes and people in Dubai. And, and Anthony's a very connected guy. I consider him a friend. Um, and I feel very bad for his situation, but he's a man. He stood up for what happened. He's admitted where he was in the situation. And I would love to see if, I hope Natalie can see this. Let's roll the clip of Anthony Scaramucci with me at the Risk On Conference back in New York just a few days ago. So I saw, uh, and I think Deirdre talked about this today too, 22 different tweets from him today. And Crazy. And I didn't see anyone covering what you're telling me. You flew down there. You saw his father. You saw Sam. We're all learning tonight that you were told he took customer money and short of Alameda. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, I, I just heard this like an hour and a half ago. I was like, I'm still like choking on it because, you know, he talked about the assets were there. They were fine to cover it. And you're saying something that is so different from what he's talking to the public about. Oh, no, but you have to understand, like, since we got on stage, um, Todd was up here before me, I was in the green room, uh, two material pieces of information came out. Number one, the effective SEC for the island of the Bahamas, the country, has frozen all the assets at FTX, number one. Number two, the general counsel for FTX US, who's a personal friend of mine, a former partner from Sullivan and Cromwell, uh, a white shoe law firm, uh, uh, sent out a message to everybody that the U.S. regulators have asked him to shut down the transaction activity at FTS U.S. And so they're deplugging the website. The assets are being frozen. So I think the facts, as I've pieced them together, are fairly accurate. I mean, so I'm so... I would love to be wrong. I'm so blown to, away. I'd play this tape and say, boy, I got this completely wrong. But I do think that this is accurate. And I'm going to say this to you. His general counsel another very smart, very talented young man. I took outside his office on Tuesday, and he made it very clear what happened, and he, he said to me, well, what should I do? I said, what you should do is you gotta tell the truth. You gotta tell the truth of exactly what happened. Okay, you're a young guy, and you can rebuild your career. If you didn't know about it, you gotta tell the truth. He resigned yesterday morning, right? Yesterday was Wednesday. He resigned yesterday morning, and then he tipped off the DOJ and the SEC, and they're involved now in the investigation. So, again, I hope I'm wrong. I don't wish anybody poorly, and we have a really good judicial process, and I want everybody to be innocent and proven, until proven guilty. But I think you got a very big issue, and if he was, he would lawyer up in a situation like this pretty quickly. So, Dali, can you shed any light on what you know about FTX customers and funds, or is this just something that you're learning like I'm learning? You know, I think we're all paying attention to the developments and we do have to be really careful because we don't want to make any conclusions without the evidence before us. But the things that are surfacing right now are extremely concerning. And the fact that there are, you know, executives from the company that are trying to flee a country, um, that's that's something that shouldn't be happening, especially if there if there was an honest management of customer money. And so I think that a lot of these questions will be answered in, in um, hopefully in the near future. But I think that this will not only give an impetus to to regulators, policymakers, lawmakers in the U.S. to, 
you know, move more quickly on, on deciding what's going to happen with digital tokens when it comes to SEC and CFTC regulations. Uh, but also, you know, it makes me wonder what don't we know is happening right now with companies that are active in the space that, you know, haven't come to surface yet. And so there's a push right now in the community for companies to release proof of reserves to show people what are their assets, to their liabilities? Are they keeping their customer funds safe? Are they, you know, rehypothecating? Are they uh, taking out loans against fake tokens that are, are used as collateral? I mean, Customers have the right to know this information. That's why there are some people in the space that really want regulation to maybe clarify the guidelines of what, what constitutes as a digital security. How do I invest in this space? Um, how do I know that I'm protected? But again, you don't have to worry about this as much with Bitcoin in the sense that it is a digital commodity, a form of digital property recognized by the SEC and by uh, government leaders. And it is an open source transparent protocol in which you finally, for the very first time, you have a digital asset that has no issuer that you can self custody that is backed by computing power and energy. Whereas all these other crypto tokens are, they do have an issuer and they're backed by essentially nothing. And that's what we saw with FTX. That's what we saw with FTT. And I really do feel bad for the painful lessons that are learned on the retail level. And I hope that people, you know, take more caution when they're when they're spending their money. I understand why they're doing it. I think all of us can relate, right? People are trying to earn yield. Everyone's chasing yield because our money is no good in the bank. So whether it's real estate or equities or now this crypto world, people are just trying to make sure their dollars preserve their value because of the government has destroyed the purchasing power of money. And so until we figure out a system of hard money again through Bitcoin, I think we're going to continue to have these problems. I don't know which one is next to fall. Joe, uh, you had some questions for Natalie, and I know uh, you were just in. Um, uh, Natalie, you probably remember Crypto Joe. He runs our mining operations. He was just in Cancun with Bitmain. And I mean, you were there for a week while we were in New York. Yep. Uh, can you tell us what the state of mind was down there during the I, middle of the crisis? I, I can tell you when it when it when it when it took the plummet. I mean, obviously there were a lot of big names there, and they they some of them were walking around just shell shocked, right? But you know that's the same community that weathered the last fall. So a lot of them are while shell shocked or like, uh, if we can just survive, uh, it's going to go back up. I mean, the faith in the mining community is different than the faith, uh, I think of the normal person, right? We're in it, we're in it to win it, or why are we, in, why are we in it at all? Um, you know, versus, and, and here's the scary part, right? Where you have Ethereum going now, proof of proof of stake instead of proof of work. The impetus at these conferences are proof of work, right? You do something, you get rewarded instead of staking it because, you know, people are staking in all these exchanges. And I think to Natalie's point, a lot of these people are, a lot of people who are in crypto just to be in crypto and then stake their crypto, including Bitcoin, right? Don't understand the full ramifications of what they're allowing to happen when they're staking that Bitcoin. And they're allowing these exchanges to lend out on, lend out on their money in order to earn a mm -hmm. yield. Some of them do, don't get me wrong, but you know, the way it's presented, I mean, I just, I think I read it was Coinbase and, and I, I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. Where they said, no, everything's held in custody and there's nothing vulnerable. But that's not true if you're staking because you're staking because they're loaning and they're loaning so that you can get a yield. So how much are they how much are they loaning? What's the stake to value, right? I mean, how many times are they loaning against that stake? Is it a one to one? Um, Natalie's right in where they need to let it out. My my personal opinion, and I'm a little bit more hardcore, maybe in the fact that I think exchanges exist to be exchanges right? I, I should be able to hold just like it can hold shares and paper value. I would suggest that everybody should hold it off off chain, right? I mean, not off chain, but off an exchange, because not only are not only are exchanges vulnerable from the lending portion of it and, and their liquidity issues, but they're vulnerable from any regulatory issues where the government walks in, the SEC says, you know what, it looks a little bit shady, we're freezing all your assets. Well, they're freezing all the assets, and none of your none of its hold like we do. And like Ernity holds uh, non-custodial um, trust accounts. These other big, re the really big exchanges don't. Your money is their money, right? So if they get frozen up, locked up, go into bankruptcy, bye bye. Natalie, um, what are your thoughts on this proof of work versus proof of state? I've heard you 
I mean, I, I'm pretty sure I know them, but I wonder for the for the viewers, what are your thoughts on on what Ethereum did? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm obviously very skeptical about proof of stake and its and its long term viability. I mean, right now a lot of the rules um, are are still unclear. I mean, this was postponed for many many years, and and it, Vitalik himself cannot answer the question of how much Ethereum is is in circulating supply right now. How much Ethereum will there be in ten years? How about fifty years? We know exactly how much Bitcoin there's going to be because everything is very transparent. And uh, right now, I think that they are building it and and putting you know pipes down without knowing if those pipes are going to going to be functioning 10 years from now and uh and so a lot of people have money staked that i don't think that they can access right now there's been issues with the validations and i think that they you know moving off proof of work was probably a mistake but it's not my it's not up to me to decide whether they are a security or not and i warn people about investing in in something that they are not sure what it's going to look like in 10 years so oh. for me proof of stake is very concerning and i don't agree with the narrative about the energy or anything like that to me it's just a bunch of mumbo jumbo um by people who are invested and 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 have a reason to want that protocol to succeed because of their own fiduciary investments um and so we'll see. We'll see what happens. But so far, it doesn't give me any reason to be confident about the future of, of that blockchain. So, so to answer your question real quick, the lockup was the initial lockup, I believe, is six months. And, and to some of the other points, I think the worst thing, uh, Ethereum, in my, in my opinion, is just a, a, a fungible token people can trade on the market. It's no longer it's no longer a decentralized currency. I think what three of the biggest houses uh, I, I want to mm -hmm. say it's it's Coinbase, uh, Binance. Binance, and I Kraken. think it's and I think it's Kraken or Gemini. Yeah. They own sixty five percent of all the tokens. Right. You've just sent, you've just made Ethereum a centralized currency. It is no longer a decentralized currency. All it well, it's take... definitely moving. Yeah, it's moving more and more towards centralization. And I, I think at the end of the day, it's just reinventing the fiat wheel that has left so many people feeling that they're like they're left behind and like they yep. don't have access to a fair financial system based on value as opposed to who's close to making the rules and who's close to the monetary spigot. So that's my really my biggest concern about it. You know, there are a lot of ideas in this space. There are a lot of entrepreneurs that are eager to innovate and build on top of this. But if the underlying infrastructure and pipes are not technically sound and ethically sound, then you're building on quicksand. And FTX was doing exactly that. So we don't even have enough information about what Ethereum in this proof of stake model is and what it will be to make, you know, judgments. But so far, it doesn't give me any reason to think that um, it has the scalability, the decentralization and the security of Bitcoin. Right. I just want to say I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Never have been. But I do grow very concerned that conspiracies I hear about come true. So are they conspiracies if they come true? I don't know. Uh, so this is a very careful part of this conversation. I'm not a political guy. Jason, you're a little more political than I am. Mm. And you mentioned earlier that Natalie spoke about payments to Ukraine, payments uh, from FTX to the Democratic Party. I've been reading stuff about MIT and relationships there with parents. We're not going to go into that part, Natalie. I, I read about them, and I'm, I'm a regulated entity, so I will, I will keep my hat out of the ring there in terms of talking about um, who works where. But um, you, I heard you commented on Fox, so maybe you could give us a little bit of your commentary on what you know about taking place on the political side. You know, I don't know much. All I do know is that there was a relationship between FTX and uh, the facilitating transactions, medium of exchange that moved money to Ukraine at one point, according to major news outlets. Um, what happened in that exactly? I, I would love to find out as well. So I'm going to monitor that. But in general, you know, what we do know for a fact is that SBF was a major donor to a political party. And it doesn't matter what side. It didn't. It doesn't matter if it's blue or right. The fact that someone could basically use counterfeit money 
and use customer deposits to wash through and prop up this token, act like he's a billionaire when he's really full of fluff, and then go before Congress and try to lobby for you know beneficial regulations for himself and his companies and act like the crypto space at large is some some something that he represents. You know, it, it's just um it takes a lot of gall to do that. And so I think that policymakers will hopefully also learn a lesson to be really careful who they're taking their money from and to vet them properly. Because like I said on the show, uh, on Maria's show this morning, this was a failure on so many levels. It was a failure that the legacy financial system, that hedge funds, pension funds, celebrities attached themselves to this, that there was a Super Bowl ad basically telling people with Steph Curry as the face saying, this is a safe place to invest your money. Um, you know, it, it's basically like if David Hasselhoff was selling reverse mortgages in the Super Bowl back in 08, 09, like you, you're not going to see that. Right. Um, so, you know, it's just, it, it needs to be addressed. People need to be held accountable. And most of all, I really do. I, I feel sorry for the people who thought that this is a way that they would be able to save a little bit of money or put something in a token that seemed cheap because Bitcoin always seems so expensive to people. They don't understand you could buy just a fraction of it. And now they're sitting unable to withdraw their funds, wondering why they were defrauded and why no one gave them this information. Um, but I do want to say the information is out there. You know, people are time constrained with their jobs uh, in the face of inflation and growing uh, unemployment. But the information is out there from Bitcoiners who continue to sound the alarm saying, please don't trust offshore exchanges with unregulated tokens that may be securities that may soon be deemed securities. Please take your Bitcoin off exchanges, self custody and know your risk. Uh, because because at the end of the day, it's sad if everyone loses money and, and someone it, the whole situation is just sad. It shouldn't have happened. It was avoidable. Mm. I was. Uh on the phone the whole weekend, Jason, and I see you have an article in front of you. And BlockFi, which was required to get that $250 million loan, <coughs> was required to put their stuff on balance sheet with, with FTX. They probably, I don't want to say it's the worst, but their situation is just terrible. They got a $250 million lo loan from FTX to fix BlockFi. And then they were required to put their, their client stuff on balance sheet there. And mm -hmm. I, I don't even know where to start about how mortifying that is. <clears throat> yeah. Well, it was already too late, right? Because at that point, mm -hmm. they were already having liquidity issues themselves. And I, I don't know the inner workings and the accounting and the reserves of BlockFi, but the truth of the matter, and I think what's interesting about this whole space is because it's unregulated and because it's so new and anyone anyone can create a crypto company and token, this is true capitalism at work because in true capitalism, risk is both rewarded and it's punished and it's not bailed out. We have a system at large in fiat with governments and massive corporations who are bailed out with taxpayer money because everything is so fragile and dependent on on everything else and cross collateralized and here we have this new parallel emerging system and when something fails well there is no fed to come in and bail all of these investors out and so you have to be very very careful and i think that in a in a way although the lessons are hard, this is how capitalism is supposed to function. You're not allowed to be too big to fail. You can't defraud your investors or you're going to go to zero and no one's going to save you. You're, you're not going to have someone, you know, step in and, and be the savior. You're going to have to pay the price and pay the consequences. And I'd rather live in a system of that, of competition, where people actually fear what would happen if they if they didn't do right by their customers. You know, this is about ethics and it's about economics and it's about technology. And if you don't have a blockchain and a company and a token that's based on ethics and technical achievement and uh, and 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 something that's economically viable and has all of the books checked, then you know you should fail. And you should, you know, you should face the consequences, but don't hurt other people. Don't take other people down. Don't take their money. And, and again, this was at a large scale. A lot of people lost money, but I think they will be more careful going forward. And again, I think this makes Bitcoin look very, very good, especially held in self-custody. Jason? I don't know. FTX was acting act like a quasi-Federal Reserve, in my opinion, trying to, trying to basically prop up everything in the sector. And now you're yeah. seeing that, you know, the FTX coin was backed by nothing. 
In my opinion, mm. the U.S. dollar is backed by nothing except the U.S. military. If you mess with the dollar, the petrodollar especially, you know, we will bomb you. So in essence, this could be a microcosm of what will happen with the Federal Reserve and the quantitative tightening that they are trying to portray is simply not there. You can look at the Fed's balance sheet. They're not tightening anything. So they're going to continue to buy mortgage-backed securities. They're going to continue to buy U.S. equities. And you could see that they did that right up into the election. And I don't want to say that, that it was political and the Fed is supposed to be nonpartisan. But if you just look at the math and the statistics and what's happening, you're going to see that the U.S. debt clock, as I pull up on my screen, Nick and Brett, is currently ticking away at $31.279 trillion. And mm -hmm. Natalie makes the case for Bitcoin because it has a finite number of coins, 21 million coins. We all know this. You're not going to be able to dilute Bitcoin. You're not going to be able to debase Bitcoin. So I'm all for Bitcoin. I'm also a silver and gold guy because precious metals have a finite number of ounces in the earth. And it takes a lot of technology and, uh, and money to extract that, that metal. So I, I'm really about Bitcoin, silver, and gold being alternative investments and currencies versus the U.S. dollar since Nixon took us off the gold standard. Everything's changed. So, Natalie, uh, I thought it would be great if we could make sure that our listeners, our viewers, will be able to watch. Uh, so where where's the best place for people to find Natalie Burnell? Where, where would you like them to go to continue to learn from you? Sure. Can I just address one thing that was just said? Because I found it really interesting. Sure. I love following macro. And I do believe that we are entering sort of this commodities cycle. And I think that this will be the decade where we see more and more uh, commodity backed money, which Bitcoin is a digital commodity. We're going to see, you know, uh, bricks and, and systems that are trying to de-dollarize. And, and what's interesting is the game theory behind this and trying to analyze, you know, on a macro level, when is the tightening going to happen? How much tightening is there going to be? It's also interesting because when you zoom out, when you zoom out and the history books were written and, you know, years condense into a couple of sentences, the fact of the matter is that debt that you just put on the screen is so unsustainable that we will eventually have to print again. And when <laughs> it prints, the question is, where will all that money go? Continually debasing the currency, stealing people's wealth mm -hmm. in the form of inflation, stealing their savings. And I bet you, as soon as that printer goes burr again, <laughs> guess what? Bitcoin is going to pop. Commodities are going to pop. People are going to try to find a safe place to store their money. I'm sure precious metals might do a little bit well. I favor Bitcoin to them. But at the end of the day, we need to figure out a way to get off of this inflationary debt spiral. And Bitcoin is I'm, I've been looking for a solution and I poke I try to poke holes in it all the time. The only solution that I have found that is technologically technologically sound and ethically sound is Bitcoin. And if you want to hear more of my show, you can go to uh, YouTube for Coin Stories and Hard Money Show. I'm also on Twitter at Nat Brunel. And I love talking about all of this. Let's, because let's go to my I, Natalie. Let's go to my screen real quick so we can do this. Sure. So, uh, OK, so there you see Natalie right there. Uh, coin stories, and you can go to Natalie Brunell. How do you find it here? Natalie Brunell, it's pretty easy to see. So I want you guys to see what this looks like so you go subscribe to Natalie. And by the way, this isn't my computer. I already subscribed, so don't think I don't. <laughs> and then over here, we have her Instagram. Uh, she has a check mark there. You can see her. Uh, and mm -hmm. by, by the way, and I apologize, Natalie, I'm 10 days uh, short of your birthday. I didn't send you a birthday wish. So oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, not very nice of me, but I was a little busy. Not that I have an excuse. <laughs> uh, Thanks so much. Yeah, check out Natalie and Peter Schiff. The great dynamics there. Um, both make their cases. I'm, You know, Natalie, I don't know why people in the community want to be either Bitcoin or silver, gold, precious metals. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just embrace both. But it's great to see the take from from Peter and Natalie on both sides. I really like Let's that. Let's go to my screen on her, on her Twitter so you guys can get a hold of her Twitter. Uh, can we put her Twitter up real quick? Okay, there's her Twitter. So, and obviously, uh, Natalie is probably one of the more connected. Everyone I ever meet anywhere in Bitcoin, no matter where I am in the world, in Dubai, in Japan, everywhere I go, yeah. they all know that Natalie was on the Risk On Show. I mean, Natalie, <laughs> you're like a superstar in Bitcoin. How do you think that happened? Well, 
I, I don't think, well, first of all, thank you. I don't see myself as that. And I love the fact that Bitcoin doesn't need superstars or CEOs or anything. I, I'm just trying to do my part and educate people on this broken system that we have that's probably hurt them financially more than more than they deserved. And, you know, I think I just, I think I resonate with some people because I'm, my, my background in media allows me to crystallize and simplify messages, which I think is needed because this is very nuanced and, and complicated as, as far as a topic. But also I think people know that I'm genuine. I, I came to this country with my family when I was five years old. My parents never asked for a handout. I watched them work multiple jobs, weekends, night and day just for their children to have a chance at an American education. They worked for economic hope, economic di dignity, economic opportunity. And the, the dream, the American dream seemed further and further away, the harder and harder they worked. They were working harder and harder for money that was worth less and less, the road to serfdom. And they lost everything in the financial cr crash just because of timing. They got their mortgage in, in the height of the bubble because you know every bank was selling mortgages and, uh, and they lost everything and had to start over. These are two really good people who just wanted to do right by their by their kids. And that's not a system that I wanna live in. That's not a fair system. That's not based on value. That's not based on, on uh, you know anything that provides me with hope of abundance and prosperity in the future. I mean, the American dream is the most beautiful thing I think that America ever created with our constitution and this idea of capitalism and, and small government and a true democracy. And we've really strayed from that and, and it really disappoints me. And so I wanna be on the, on the front lines of fighting for a better future because the more that our money is abundant, our future, our material things, our money, um, the, what it's worth will be scarce, will be will be debased and continue to go down in value. Whereas if we have a finite supply of money and we can reorder society with an economy that's based on hard money that cannot be manipulated by the elites, then now we can create an economy based on value, based on prices, ba based on real prices and real interest rates, supply and demand. And that's where I think meritocracy will finally have a chance to thrive instead of the people who are closest to the money printer, the central bank, they benefit at the expense of everyone else, privatize their gains, socialize the losses, society gets more and more frustrated, populism grows, the left and the right divide more and more. It's like, come on guys, we're, we're more alike than we are different. We want a better life for our, our families. We wanna do right by them. We wanna maybe leave a, a small legacy and we should have the chance to do that. It shouldn't be so rigged. The system now is rigged, and I think that Bitcoin can help fix that. Joe, any thoughts before we let Natalie go? I just need, I, I want to tell her that, you know, ev everywhere I go, if someone asks me about Bitcoin, how do, I, how do I learn about Bitcoin? What do I do with Bitcoin? I just point them to Natalie. <laughs> I, I mean this honestly. I point them to her That's YouTube. Right. I get, I tend to be on the technical side of it, so I tend to get way too technical. And I think the way she demonstrates and, and tells people the true thoughts about where she is with Bitcoin is great. I, I think she's right in general. You know, I think that, I think that- It's a love fest for Natalie. It, 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 it is, yet? but you know what? It's because, <laughs> it, it's because she, she, she illustrates the point of using Bitcoin so well that, that it, it, it's worthwhile, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna summarize her, her thoughts on Bitcoin and I'll see if I'm right. But only after Jason. What's up? Natalie, just a couple more questions. Do you think there's more balls to drop in this sector, in the Bitcoin sector? And if so, I, do you, I mean, and, and as that relates to price of Bitcoin in fiat, which I wasn't, I wish it wasn't priced in fiat, but that's a different conversation. Um, where, mm -hmm. do you, where do you see um, any additional um, sore spots within the community? Do you see something tragic happen with uh, another exchange? Do you see something happen with Gensler and, and Janet Yellen and, uh, you know, a strict... Um, you know, rule of law coming down with regulation on, on the space, especially Bitcoin. Let me get your thoughts on that. Thank you. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm really bullish on on regulation because I think at, at least with Gary Gensler at the SEC, he did a, an amazing lecture series where he demonstrated the fact that he really understands Bitcoin and why it's different, why it's separate from uh, crypto. So, you know, it's already been recognized. He feels comfortable calling it a digital commodity and digital property. There certainly could be improvements in terms of fair accounting uh, rules so that more institutions could feel comfortable putting Bitcoin on their balance sheets. Um, and so I think actually it'll be very, very bullish. And, and you know, I want to remind people that about a year ago, federal 
uh, Reserve Chair Jerome Powell said there can be more than one global reserve currency. I don't know if you guys uh, remember him saying that. And mm -hmm. I would say that the only one at the institutional and reserve currency uh, grade would be Bitcoin. So I, I'm very bullish on regulation. Again, if I if I was actually in charge of a crypto exchange or had some sort of crypto token, um, I'd be more concerned because I think that the SEC will come down on, on some of these crypto tokens that mm -hmm. were similar to FTT. I think we're not going to have a world in 10 years where there are 20,000 unregulated, unregistered tokens. There will be um, a pathway for companies that have exchanges and want to create tokens or NFTs to register them and, and investors will have more information and so to me the the future of that space looks more like digital equities or, or or digital stocks where you're you're talking about platforms and and issuers specific issuers of currencies so i think that all of that will be revealed in time and i'm not sure if you had another question in there i probably forgot it but uh, it was just yeah, about the uh, i'm sorry about the uh, exchanges any more balls to drop any I hidden i certainly think there could be more balls to drop and i really want to urge people get your coins off exchanges, put them in self custody, learn to self custody. There are so many resources out there. There are great names in the Bitcoin space that have done tutorial videos. Um, it's really not as hard as it, as it sounds or looks. It's just you taking custody and taking them off the internet and off an exchange so that you are the custodian, you are your own bank and it's much safer. You trust yourself probably more than you trust some random uh, third party that may or may not be in the US and sells a bunch of different tokens. So. I wouldn't be surprised if there's an, another shoe to drop. I think Bitcoin could drop lower. For me, I see this as you know an accumulation opportunity. But I've also studied this space extensively, so that's why I always say on my show, you know, this is for informational purposes, educational purposes. It's everyone has to do their own homework and assess their own risk, um, because right now times are really volatile. Inflation is still very, very sticky. They're going to try to continue to tighten. I think there could be a capitulation moment on a macro level that could also impact Bitcoin. Um, we see these issues within the crypto space, you know, sort of dissolving. So. People should be very, very careful and take the time to study Bitcoin. And if you buy Bitcoin, take it off the exchange, self-custody it. So Amen. let me summarize, Natalie. Amen. Buy Bitcoin, put it in your own wallet. Everything else is all nonsense and uh, human beings wrecking something that's almost as close to perfect as it can be. It's the best system we have right now. That's my opinion. I think that's Natalie's opinion. Natalie, is that your opinion? Yeah, until I'm proven wrong... I see Bitcoin as the only solution to the Fiat Ponzi scheme. Ooh. I love that. And on that note, yeah. special thanks to Natalie Burnell for being here. Natalie, we'll catch up soon. Looking forward to the things we're doing in the future. Take care, Natalie. Thank Congratulations, you. by the way, on Italy. I know something's going on there. I'm, I'm a little <laughs> jealous. I'm hearing I'm hearing rumors, as as our friend used to say, our, our orange man friend. I'm hearing rumors. <laughs> I don't know where I'm hearing them, but I'm hearing them. They're saying it on the Internet. Anyways, <laughs> Natalie, take care. <laughs> Uh, Thank you. All right, everybody. So we're going to have Skylar join us. Um, we're going to answer a few questions uh, as Natalie leaves us. Um, I've got to say, the questions I get about BitNile are so bizarre. Um, on, a, on an asset base of nearly $600 million, I get a lot of questions about an aircraft purchase. And I just don't, I don't understand what... I don't understand what people are concerned about, but uh, maybe I'm just disconnected. But for those people who understand what chartering is, you pay one price to operate it, you pay another price when you charter to people, and therefore the difference between the price you pay per hour and the price you chartered for is the, is the amount of money you make. I am not gonna make a single other comment on that plane because it's part of a network uh, that we are will be announcing as part of other planes uh, in the charter business, um, and if people don't understand what the marketplace is going to be, the Bitcoin marketplace is a experienced marketplace based, and you'll be able to do things like charter aircraft using Bitcoin. You'll be able to use it with regular fiat currency. In fact, you'll be able to use twenty-two. The plan is that you to be able to use twenty-two different forms of fiat currency in a bunch of different cryptos. Although it seems like a lot of those cryptos are going away. Yeah. Um, we're in oil and gas now, guys. We, we are a lender. We're a defense company. Uh, turn on green. Making some progress there. Correct. So I'm happy to answer your questions, but I don't know if they're really questions because I get them from only a few people, and they, you focus on, on the big scheme of all we have. Um, 
I get the I get the strangest questions, but this is one of them. It says here, can you give a light REG on the jet purses? Okay, it must be reason. The annual revenue lease hourly rate. Uh, a G550 leases for between seven and nine thousand an hour, and your operating costs are about forty one hundred an hour. I have no other commentary other than that. Um, we are making a ton of progress on the Giga Dividend, uh, the GWW, which we announced uh, the other day, and we are making a lot of progress on the S1. Uh, and I think we'll have news on the S1 sometime around the dividend, sometime around earnings, which is next week. So stay tuned for that. Earnings is next week. I think it's on the 21st or 22nd. We will let you know by a press release about when we'll have the conference call. And I'm expecting to update the market on the special dividend that is turned on green at that time. Um, special thanks to Natalie. Um, yeah, she's Jason, great. Um, your thoughts on the state of the market? The overall. Uh, specifically, what's going on with FTX? Yeah, well, I mean, like I said, FTX was like the Fed trying to bail everybody out. And when the Fed fails, everything fails. Everything They were using customer funds, it looks like. Of course. I mean, allegedly. allegedly. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, going to Alameda Capital, allegedly using the funds there to trade. This is all alleged alleged stuff, uh, but that's what we're seeing right now. Yeah, guys, I appreciate you. Uh, it's been a tough uh, Bitcoin market, but guess what? You guys remember I, all those people saying I shouldn't have sold our Bitcoin when we were selling it at 22000 25000 30000 32000 Yeah, We were doing it for balance sheet purposes. We didn't lend out our Bitcoin. Um we didn't come into it with a lot of leverage, so we're not in the same position that everyone else is. We, we just are not that same company. And you guys can try to categorize how you want, but we're just not the same. We are broadly diversified, including owning our own, uh, our own data center up in Michigan. And so I'm incredibly proud of the team. Is it perfect? No. Boats, but yeah. Mining update December 1st, we're planning on it. I'm incredibly proud of the team and where we are. I Special thanks to everybody. Skyla, do you have even remotely something funny that would help us like not think about bitcoin the ftx debacle for a second i don't know uh i wish um natalie was still on because okay so i do have a joke how do vampires pay their mortgage how do vampires pay their mortgage cryptocurrency crypto cryptocurrency. Oh, crypto. Ah, that's oh, okay. funny yeah, thank sure you natalie i feel like natalie would have nice. appreciated that everybody uh Everybody, super special thank you to people, my whole entire staff, Willie putting on a great show with John Stewart back in New York. Special thanks to my producer, uh, Christy, Brett, and Nick, the whole team, Kalik, everyone that went back to work on uh, our new hotel that opened up, we're a partner in, Jason for being there, Skyla, Roland, the entire team, it was great. Anthony Scaramucci, you are completely, in, to me, everybody... Those 90 people who sat in that invitation-only crowd got to listen to a guy who was transparent, that told you about his flaws, his strength, his weaknesses. His wife was there. I had such a great time with Anthony Scaramucci. I love the guy. I think he is legit. When he has an issue, he tells you like it is. Um, and I, I'm proud to call him a friend. I think it was great. What about, what did you think of the, of the, whole, the whole show, uh, Jason? I like the fact how transparent he is, and he admits to his mistakes, and he owns stuff. And, you know, it's a lot of good insight for his, what, 11 days in mm -hmm. office with President Trump? Yep. So, yeah, it was, it was great. Great interview. I've been here for uh, doing this for 32 or three years. I've seen tons of scandals and problems, and we're more transparent now than ever before on the Internet. You can go say whatever you want. You can make up whatever you want. Uh, I've been through this before. We'll get out of this again. I think Bitcoin's here to stay. <laughs> Um, and in some really weird, messed up way, um, there are a lot of people out there. You know, I remember the days of the internet when when I was like, how did how can you value something with no sales at at you know a billion dollars? And it just started, and it just because you put a dot com. These manias happen all the time. <laughs> But it doesn't mean the underlying fundamental technology like the internet, like dot-com. I can give you a scenario. The Nifty 50 in the 70s, uh, Motorola, all these scenarios where they get overdone, these boom-bust cycles are healthy. I know that's hard for uh, um, I know it's hard for people to understand that. Um, 
but if it were me, I would stay the course and just relax. Uh, listen to what Natalie says about protecting your Bitcoin. Yeah. If you're on a, if you're on an exchange which gives you, if you lose sleep at night, uh, I would I would do what I could. I'm not gonna blow smoke up your butt about uh, Ernity. It's my understanding that Bitcoin and Ernity is held in a trust in your name. It's not on their balance sheet. I'd look into that. I have money there at Ernity. I have money at Coinbase. Um, and what I would encourage all of you to do is just to re-examine your relationships and understand if you were getting paid ridiculous rates of, of staking and why you were getting those paid on your crypto. Um, I'd look to, I mean, it's probably a little too late to delever. Yeah. Anyways, special thanks to everyone that was at the show, all the people that attended, Phuket, Josh Caspi, all those people. <clears throat> everyone, we'll see you again. Risk on, everybody. Take care.